Hi, and welcome to RBP on JSB. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and today we're going to be talking about the fifth and final movement of Bach's Partita No. 2 in D minor, the famous Shakona. By the way, if you want to hear a discussion about some of the general topics that pertain to all of the sonatas and partitas, please be sure to watch the overview episode. So the great Bach Chaconne, considered to be one of the pinnacles of not only all of the violin repertoire, but indeed all of classical music itself, and rightfully so. And so how do we even contemplate playing this piece? It has so much baggage, it's on such a pedestal. And it also has so much misunderstanding surrounding it. Um, some people think it's supposed to be a virtuosic showpiece, but I think that the only thing that Bach was showing off was his compositional prowess. I don't think it's meant to be showing off your technique. Your technique, even in the hard spots, should really be at the service of the musical intention. Is it meant to be a requiem for his first wife who passed away prematurely, as was theorized a couple of decades ago? Well, that theory, um, as appealing as it might have been to people who like a good conspiracy, it has been thoroughly debunked, I'm sorry to tell you. There is no such thing going on. And indeed, it does, never made sense in the first place. People in the Baroque era didn't tend to be autobiographical in their compositions. That didn't happen till a century later. And, you know, this music is great enough to stand on its own two feet. It doesn't have to mean anything other than its notes to be a miracle. But what emotions is it expressing? Is it a deep, dark tragedy? Is it, you know, all of the human condition? Again, I don't think it has to do that. And I don't necessarily think that it does. After all, a chacon is a dance. This piece never stops dancing, no matter what's going on. The spirit of the dance is never totally absent. Now, it doesn't mean that it's just a lighthearted, you know, whatever. Um, it definitely is serious and deep and all of those things. And of course, it has just an incredible, um, you know, palette of emotions. Uh, it goes through all kinds of different moods and characters. But I don't think it's, you know, deep, dark, and tragic. I just really don't. After all, think about it. What is the other famous work for violin in the key of D minor? Well, we all know and love it. It's the double concerto, of course. <laughs> piece is nothing if not cheerful, and yet it's in D minor. Doesn't mean that minor key um, even has to be sad at all. That piece is happy, and it's in D minor. Okay, I don't think that the Chacon is cheerful. I wouldn't go that far, but it just proves that you can't say, well, it's in D minor, it must be dark, because that argument simply doesn't hold water. The dance beat of the Chacon is similar to the Sarabande in that beat two is the most important thing going on. But unlike the Sarabandes that start on beat one and go one, two, three, the Chacons always start on beat two. Two, three, and one, two, three, and one. And um, very similar to the Pasacalia, another close cousin, and I won't get into a long discussion of the differences between Chacons and Pasacalias and similarities, and if you want to read about it, just you know, go to Grove Music and you have, could find more information than you ever wanted. But in any case, um, interestingly, in this Chacon, as is true for many others, um, Bach doesn't stick to that particular dance beat pattern. There's always some kind of beat going on, but sometimes he varies it and makes it one, two, three, one, two, three. And you can analyze, you know, finding all of how it shifts and where it shifts and what variation does what and where the variations begin and end. I'm not going to give you all the answers because searching for them is an important part of exploring this piece for yourself and really learning how it's constructed. But a chacon is a variation form. All chacons are sets of variations. That's what they are. Always starting with an eight bar, either a bass line, um, that stuff is just on top of or kind of a melody, but it's really over a bass. And even in here, Bach goes farther than many composers, and the bass line itself um, tends to morph as it goes along. And there are many analyses you can find that, you know, figure it all out and show you where 
different things happen and you can try to figure it out for yourself. Going into that level of detail of what the baseline is doing isn't actually completely necessary for interpreting um, this particular shakon, but it's just kind of a fun exercise. If you're bored, you can do that instead of a sudoku, I suppose. Besides the dance beat changing up and actually shifting around, there are five spots where I believe that Bach inserts hemiolas on top of this you know, three, four rhythm. Instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, he does a big three where the half note becomes the beat over two bars, one and two and three and, and I'll show you where those three are. The first one is in 26. So one, two, one, three. So, um, That one you can kind of tell because it has the da 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 dum bum ba da da dum bum bum. That's kind of showing you that it's gone into that big three. Um, next one would be measure 146. And it's very, very, um, very typical, though not necessarily exclusive, that. Um, Hemiolas will fall at the end of cadences, um, or right before you know a final note or leading into a final note. Sometimes they happen in random other places, but very, very often they do happen in cadential moments like that one in 146. We've got another one in 182. That one I could understand if you think that the one two, three pattern continues. Let's go back to 180. And then one. So there might be no hemiola at all. I could totally see it not being a hemiola, but it could be, and it's just a fun option to consider. Next one is 206, which of course is a big, big cadence. Um, Let's see, that's a weird place to start. Mm. Oh, that's right, it's, it's arpeggiated. It's... Right, so the... Right, so that's um, most likely a hemiola, a pretty strong argument in favor of it. Because that beat three of 206 is a much stronger chord than what's on beat two, so therefore it seems like it should be the big beat two. One and two and three and. And did I miss one? Let's see, one, two, three, four, that's all of them. Okay, so the last one is the very end of the piece, which is an unmistakable hemiola because you have absolutely nothing on the third to last bar in beat two, so it must be a um, big three. So if you give too much emphasis to the downbeat of the, of the penultimate bar, then you're kind of getting rid of the hemiola af, um, effect. But if you go... Now, there is a seventh on that downbeat, so you could say, well, a seventh is a stronger chord. However, um, the fact that the rhythmic pattern of the melody is... Then clearly, it's not that you're going to go... That just doesn't make sense. So, one... So keeping those hemiolas in mind, um, let's actually go through the three big sections of this piece, which of course are clearly delineated by the key changes, minor key, major key, minor key. So the very opening, what is the character of this dramatic start to this movement? Well, the answer is always to any question about any movement of Bach's partitas that it should dance. But beyond that, of course, it should be you know, very dramatic and very poised and stuff like that. I wouldn't give too much weight to the eighth 
you know, and definitely not the old-fashioned. That's certainly somehow satisfying to play, but it, it's not, it doesn't feel like Bach anymore. It's fun nonetheless, but find some other piece that has three note chords if you want to do that. Play some Ernst or something. Anyhow, um, so a gesture, da, 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 as is often useful when doing um, box movements with big chords. If you do it without the chords, you can sometimes feel what the music is. Remembering that at least when it starts out, beat two has more importance than beat one, so making sure it's on that we don't do too much on beat one, so. And there I would let it breathe. Don't rush ahead. But let it have some poise. taking to do all of these gestures and that's totally allowed. We don't have to be bound by any kind of rule of the downbow when playing solo music. Rule of the downbow really exists for uniformity of sections in orchestras, which was starting to be a thing in the Baroque era. The high Baroque was the first time when orchestra sections were starting to all bow things the same way at the same time and it was a really big deal. Um, but you know, we still sometimes want to do retakes to let our gestures have um, you know more ease of achieving what it is that we want it to sound like. We don't have to be bound by doing as it comes. You can experiment with that, but I personally think that doing the downs helps things. definitely still one, two, three. So people who um, hook, or it's actually a bit confusing to remember what that bowing is. Haven't hooked in, actually I don't know if I ever did. I guess maybe I did briefly when I was a teenager. Anyhow, um, making sure that it's not dun, da 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 dun, da dun. And it's very obvious from the chords which beats Bach thinks have, you know, yum, ba, ja, da, da, da. if it doesn't have a whoosh on it, probably it's not so important. And make sure that you also group the notes together. So playing, for example, measure nine, just the, the moving voice, you might be doing it as it comes, but you're not gonna go, because then you've got one, two, three, which is not chacon like at all. In fact, it's good to practice just that and then add your chord. And even another level of detail, making sure your beat two is stronger than your beat one and that your beat three is lightest of all, like we already discussed. He did write a double D, so you gotta do it. And give yourself a smidge of time to make it work. Don't try to shove it in there, because then that wouldn't work. Then you might as well just do the easy one without the double note. Some old edited editions will actually leave off a lot of these primes in the arpeggio section and elsewhere, but Bach wrote them for a reason, because he wanted a little bit more whoosh. He wanted that G string being part of things. So don't discount the importance of doing double Ds when they occur. Um, then he has the same thing when it goes into the, the more soprano voice thing at 16. And here I might do three beats. Just for variety, perhaps. Then we've got our nice little um, 
you know, polyphonic section starting at 24. Maybe more lyrical. Or. play 24 with a number of different possible characters. 32, same thing. There, I think it actually does make sense to make this more legato. And then your bass note's not gooey. Bum, 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 like your cellist would play it. Then two little two notes. Show the slurs in the next section. So here it's so interesting. One, two, three, one, 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 two, three, one, two, three, one, one, right? So if you kind of play it all legato y, then you don't hear the slurs as clearly. See how it all kind of smooths in together and you lose them, so... Now here we do have lots of separate notes. Nice scale. And a scale leading down instead of up. A slur scale. Then a really long slur. Then a fun passage. One of Bach's jazzy measures. One, two, th one, two, three, four, one. Da 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 da. And then here, um, there is at least one, if not two, urtext editions that print what I truly believe is a wrong bowing in measure 48, where they have a slur that starts on the second sixteenth of every measure. If you look at Bach's manuscript, I think, and I'm not the only one, um, that it clearly starts from the third note. So never trust in her text. You've always got to look at the manuscript and think about things for yourself. Even an unedited edition is still somebody's opinion. <laughs> Etc. Then you've got measure 56, which is so um, spirited. Here he's clearly changed the dance beat. One and uh, and three. One, two and three. One. So two is the least important beat now, but it's still got a beat. So make sure that you really hear that. Not you do that and it sounds like eighth, 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 and we lose the dong. thing that's happening. Now here's an interesting fact. Measure 56 has a th slur over three of the sixteenths. Measure 57 has slurs over none of the sixteenths. Measure 58 has two pairs of two. So clearly that must be wrong, right? Because they're all the same music, so they should all be uniform. Well, uniformity was not seen as a virtue in the Baroque era. It was seen as bad musicianship for being boring. And so I think Bach absolutely meant to have this variety. And furthermore, the two-note slurs at the end of 58 lead very nicely into the continued two-note slurs in 59. So I think he's having it one way one time, one way another time, this wonderful, interesting little spot. <laughs> becomes undancy. Here, obviously, he's gone back to one, two. Except you have these little bass notes on three, so I don't know what's going on. Um, then we come to 64. Three, one, three, one. Okay, and here, there's a missing slur in measure 66. So, should we put it in? I actually have not yet been able to feel physically comfortable with Because you'd have to put an up-up at the end there. 
Um, you could do it. It's possible, but I don't like it. So that's my reason. I just don't like it. Um, but there is a missing slur there. So, you know, think for yourself and decide. <laughs> He has a slur, and here, so measure 69, should it be good to the last 16th of the first beat, or separated like it is in 70, hard to say, maybe it should be good. the slurry version. I just don't personally like the way it sounds, so I do make measure 69 conform to measure 70. Maybe I shouldn't, but that's just what I do. Um, but try for yourself and see what you like, and you, you know, neither is completely wrong. Um, another place where he leaves off a slur is the end of measure 79, after a pattern that starts in 76 with slurs on each of the fourth beats, he then, by the end, doesn't. And so maybe the last one he wanted to mix it up, or maybe he left off a slur. Don't know. And then here, the question is, should these be... I used to always do them kind of delicate and a little bit, you know, weeping. And now I actually do the opposite. I kind of let it soar. And make sure that you do the real bowing here instead of or something like that that Bach wrote. And you can even take little breaths. Just very subtly, of course. And then I start that whole build soft to go up and you know get you into your arpeggios. So that works for me to do 80 a bit fuller and then come down. And, but there's lots of different options. Whatever you do, you need to map it out. So I found that it was a really good exercise to actually take a nice you know, printed or text edition, a blank copy, and actually write in dynamics and even little hairpins for phrases and everything, actually put it on the page because I discovered that there were certain moments where I really hadn't made a decision, that I was just kind of playing along any old way, kind of doing it so-so until I started to think, okay, what do I do there? And realized I wasn't really doing anything there. It forced me to have thoughts at all and it helped me define what those thoughts were. So here we start at 84, maybe a bit soft and growing. And then I, you know, kind of have this bit louder into the arpeggios. But actually, there, you could totally make an argument for 30 seconds being very, you know, active. And maybe this is actually a more exciting section. This is growing because it's going up the arpeggio. be totally justified in that approach. I've seen plenty of people do it and do it very effectively. But you, you know, can only do one interpretation in a night whenever you're performing it. You have to do, you have to get rid of all the other options and be left with one. So um, sometimes it's hard. It's like, oh, I like this way, but I like this way, but I like this way, but I can only choose one. It's like, what outfit are you going to wear today? You like these five different tops, but you can only, you know, wear one at a time. Okay, so um, this brings us to our arpeggios. So making sure that in 92, starting on the second beat, um, that the lower voice takes precedence. So as you're doing the arpeggio, and always once, that, that makes it two eighth notey. So each, so let's see if I can do this um, slow-mo. Okay, that's exaggerated, of course, but that's the idea. So instead of just being part of the harmony, now the bass line is the moving line. Now the 
upper voice, so you need to actually... So what you might want to do is practice that, which is a little, not what we're used to when bowing arpeggios. Just tick one note. Just do it till you're used to it. Light, heavy, light, heavy, heavy on those up bows. And now put it into the music. Now, even weirder, the middle voice. So just take one set of notes. See if. Now you're not going to really be doing portamentos in the middle. So don't do it like a lean with your index finger because there's no time for that at speed. It's kind of lean as you pass by it with your whole arm. Right, so... Kind of doing whatever you can to make that middle voice kind of emerge from the texture. Um, in 108, I would start a little bit softer. Let's see, sorry. And then going off the scale. long notes so it's not just uh, those long slurs so it's not just but and make sure of course this one is resonant it can ring for most of your bow this one of course can't it has no natural resonance but pretend it is this one too then every bead getting more intense and here's a trick Cover your, the A note with your fourth finger in measure 123 so that you don't bump the D string as you're rolling across to the open A. And here, put it on the E, so if you do bump it, at least it's a good chord. But it should be okay to just bypass the D string. So. And then you're back to your opening statement. And that concludes the first section. So part two is this amazing moment where it's like the heavens open up. You know, after all this minor key stuff, suddenly this change to major key is, is just like this incredible spiritual thing that happens. And I used to play it very hushed and reverently, almost like, you know, a prayer. <laughs> To this day, I'm always tempted to do that, even still. It just feels so good. But you know what? It doesn't fit my tempo. It doesn't fit my concept of the movement as a dance movement. It's really superimposing something on top of music that it's not. So I have to still make it a little bit bouncy, but much more calm, of course, calm and more cheerful. <laughs> a bit of that character, but now it's still a chacon, as opposed to where I completely lost the chacon in my original version. Um, now, separate bows, always a good idea. And in fact, the fact that it is separate bows and not any written slurs um, gives argument in favor of not being too adagio at the start of this um, major key section, because then, you know, by five bars in, in measure 136, that just wouldn't even fit. So... <laughs> 
then of course we're back to the one, two, three. <laughs> making sure that the three-eighths of two, um, even. And continuing on in measure 148 after the hemiola. So really de-emphasizing those third beats. shifts in the piece to make it clean to get the timing do that like 500 times every day um, and then we have this wonderful multiple voices stuff at 160 little trumpet over there and then a little bass line so this is one voice another voice uh, another voice, and then the bass voice is kind of in the top here, and then here, trumpet voice, filler, bass voice, trumpet voice, so you're just making it sound complex, like it's multiple voices in dialogue, and of course here it very obviously is by 168. More insistent, etc. Then back to our um, one, two, and one, two, and one. Don't even say three, because three is like not even in there. One, two, and one from 176. Separate bows. one, two, and one thing if you make all of the eighths strong. So shape them. So. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, then going on. Make sure separate bows in 187 to bring out the polyphony. Always with those kind of chords, the question is, do you use your 4-4? Four, four? I'd say if it's arpeggiated, you have to, so you can go across the strings. Even when it's awkward, but something like this, maybe. If, you know, if you're going to lose the G string, that's probably less important than the fact that the F fifth just sounds lucky unless you have a big sausage of a fourth finger and can really get that fifth for somebody with a skinny four like me. It's just impossible for it to sound great. Even on gut strings, it doesn't sound fantastic. So... ring, of course. Um, another separate bows at 191. I would bring the dynamic down in 192 so you have a lot of room to grow up this scale. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to rush through it to show you how it goes, but anyway. And then this your right. Bum, 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 bum. 
So here it's kind of the first beats that are doing something. <laughs> chord is almost impossible to reach. Look at the contortion of my hand. So just try to stretch the frog webbing between your two and three. Bring your elbow over. You know, we all know the rule, elbow under in the first position. But here you just got to do whatever you can do to try to make those notes get to the finger. So um, just bring your elbow way up. Put your four and three down, lean your two and one backwards. So don't try to put yourself here in half position with your one and two and then reach your three and four. Unless you have super long fingers, you literally can't. So put yourself more up here and then leaning down. And then there's another weird one with a two tucked in there. And we've got to hear it. Because then we have the upper voice there, the middle voice and 204 middle voice still, then the third voice. So we have our soprano, then our alto, then our ten tenor, and then your bass. See that? Bach symmetry, as always, soprano, alto, alto, tenor, bass of the little moving eighths through this whole last section. Here, by the way, in order to grab the double D, I jump to second position just for a beat, so I can use my three to help me, and then back to my four. Of course, you're a alone. And actually, the placement of these eighths and the original beat one um, makes the hemiola more obvious because it's dum, bum, 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 ba, da, dum for our big three. Now we're on our final section, and as you may have noticed, each section is getting progressively shorter as we go along, more Bach symmetry. So starting in 208 with the key change, back to emphases on the second beats. So tuck away those third beats. And then now the third beats seem to be the thing. with that one. Now we have bass notes starting in 216. Now you don't have to exaggerate them that much for them to show, just enough that people get the point. Now we have a wonderful, interesting slur pattern with some bass notes. Dun dun da da dun da da dum da da dum da da dum and and make sure you don't hook because then it doesn't dance. You could do that either with a four to put them all in the G string or just leave it with a more comfortable fingering with an open D. And da da yum, kind of going to the, the downbeat of that third beat. And then all this stuff. Then you somewhere have to reverse yourself. I take a double down here. In measure 227. Okay, so now we're with our wonderful Berriolage passage in 228. And we've got a number of things going on. We've got our big bass notes. All right, then the bass line breaks out over there in 235. Um, and then we've also got our melody. A 
shape. Um, oh, so the shape is in the bass line. Okay, so make sure it doesn't just go along beady, but actually has shape. become chordy, that they really truly sound like three notes. So, and one, and one is kind of what's going on here at 240. You can take a little bit of time, which does help things. And then you've got lots of them in a row. For this passage, I would recommend practicing pairs of them at a time. So, getting your left hand coordination working and your right hand coordination as well. And then the next one would be starting on the one you left off at. Then the next one. And then try to put a few together etc. until you can make your way through the whole passage. Then we've got big bass notes at 244. So one, three, one, three, one. So no more second beats here. And make sure those don't get all smeared together. But yet another one of the handful of very long slurs in the Bach Six Sonatas and Partitas. Try to do it all in one bow. <laughs> big A that gets you to the tip and then... <laughs> even if it means that you don't have quite as much power on all those 30 seconds, there's something nice about being able to just, you know, end with, a, with an up bow. <laughs> as opposed to... <laughs> to do splitting it up um, and then now I break my own rule of trying to do box long slurs for real um, in 254 because I just cannot figure out a solution otherwise if I do it all in one bow starting down bow and then I'm on up bow here I guess I could drop the F and do that, or doing all of that slurred in would not be um, very Baroque, so. It does work, but it just depends on what you want the ending to be. If you don't mind that it's a little bit lighter, then certainly that bowing is ergonomically um, you know, possible. But if you feel like after this whole huge piece you need something a bit grander, then it, this down bow is just not going to give it to you. Anyway, I can't make it effective. Maybe you can. Um, another possibility would be, of course, to start up bow. Then I like to have this seven, so I kind of drop the D so it's not a slur in the bass. Drop the B kind of like our right, so drop. Then I have the seventh. So you have short, short. So if I do this up bow, again, it's just not enough power for me. Um, I like to split that bow, what can I say? But when I do split it, I make it try to sound like one long slur to not let the bow change be at all obvious. Etc. And by the way, a couple of points right before it. Um, the same breath that we talked about in the beginning at 252. And then a phrase through these five notes.
So those are lots of my thoughts about the D minor chaconne. I'm Rachel Barton Pine, and thank you for watching RBP on JSB.